I think being ready to accept an opportunity and believing that you can do it. Um, sometimes self-confidence is false and it's not justified objectively, but sometimes you just have to go for it and learn and, you know, there's that saying that you fake it until you make it. Uh, just understanding that if you work hard enough, you can learn to be what you want to be. Hey, Dr. Bill here. So we're going to do another Meet the Mentor with a very interesting man. Please tell your friends to listen to Meet the Mentor. It's an amazing source of information. And the one thing that differentiates our podcast from others is a lot of podcasts you know, talk to successful people and ask them like what the secrets of their success are and what I'll be doing today. And I've already warned uh, my uh, interviewee here is I want to get takeaways for students who are listening to this that might want to go into the same line of work and find out like what is it that you need to be doing right now at this stage of your life if you really want to have a career like his and you want to have a career like his because it was pretty awesome. Um, so let me introduce Jonah Shackney. 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 Um, hard name to say. Um, he serves as the executive chairman of Dermaforce Partners, an aesthetic technology firm that develops and globally commercializes novel cosmetic skin products, which are mainly sold in doctor's offices. And he'll talk to you a little bit about that, why they made that choice, under the brand name Skin Better Science. Um, prior to that, he was the founder of Dermaforce he was also the founding chairman and executive officer for Medicis Pharmaceutical Corporation. He's also got a very diverse background um, in public service, in law, in science, and then corporate background with substantial experience and expertise in the pharmaceutical healthcare industries. Um, he serves as the co-chair for the foundation board uh, the campaign for tobacco free kids and a lot of other nonprofits and um, he especially likes working with economically challenged athletes and people with disabilities thank you Jonas for coming here so let's start off in the beginning because you had a very very unusual kind of career you started off on Capitol Hill at the age of what 21 uh, 20 yeah. 20 how did that happen and how did that lead into what you're doing today sure um, I went to a college called Colgate University back east and the college and the American Political Science Association had a fellowship uh, and that fellowship placed me on Capitol Hill for six months and at the end of that period um, the, the congressman the chairman of the committee that I was working for offered me a full-time job and just by dint of some weird circumstances I became his top guy uh, a couple of months after I joined his staff on a full-time I basis. know, but like at 21, tell them what you were doing. I, this is unbelievable. Well, uh, by the time I was 21, which uh, seemed an advanced age at that time, um, I was uh, actually helping to run one of the congressional committees that had oversight over the science, technolo science and technology elements of the U.S. economy. And from there, I went on um, and ran a committee called uh, Consumer Protection and Finance, and we had jurisdiction over most of the economy. So it was an awesome job for a 21-year-old kid that had no experience. Um, I'm sure I was full of uh, piss and vinegar, um, but at the time, um, I, I had no idea how little that I knew, but I guess I was faking it pretty effectively. And as you were doing that, they encouraged you to go to law school, right? My, my chairman, my boss, encouraged me to go to law school, and I went to Georgetown, although um, I was hardly a model student, but I graduated. Okay, so you graduate law school. Now you have a little bit of experience on Capitol Hill, a little bit of experience in law school, and all of a sudden, how did you get into the whole pharmaceutical and skincare and all that? What, what transpired? Well, one of the federal agencies that we had jurisdiction over that we oversaw was the Food and Drug Administration and other health policy organizations like the National Institutes of Health. So while I was on Capitol Hill, I had a lot of experience working with those agencies and their constituencies, industry people, um, medical researchers, uh, scientists. 
and it was very attractive. This was definitely the knowledge part of the economy. This was kind of before the tech boom. Um, so research and development was largely focused on healthcare and major innovations, and it was kind of a golden period. And I really wanted to be part of it, and, and I became so. Well, I mean, how did you start? And, and what was it that you did first? Um, first, I uh, was associated with a company in Florida called Key Pharmaceuticals. And it was the first major specialty pharmaceutical company. So instead of concentrating on a million different things, it concentrated just on asthma and cardiology. So we developed a couple of drugs that became very famous, one called Theodur, one called Nitrodur. And uh, what exactly were you doing there? Uh, so I was uh, in a strange situation. The two guys that were owning and running the company uh, had a challenged personal relationship. Uh, as the company became more successful, uh, they became greater rivals. And my job was really to sit in between them and sort of translate communications from one to another. All right, so you have a little background in business, you have a little background in law, you have a little background working with the FDA and all this, and now you're in a business situation where you're developing new drugs and you're basically a buffer between two partners that are having a hard time in business. Two geniuses okay. that had really an inability to speak with one another. So they needed an intermediary that they could both trust. And you're how old at this time? Um, yeah, I was in my mid-20s. In your mid-20s? I guess I had an honest face. Okay. And from there, where'd you go? Uh, from there, I through that experience, when that company was sold, I developed the confidence uh, or the foolishness to start my own company, a company called Medicis. Uh, so when I was in my late 20s, I started this company that was focused really in dermatology. And over the course of our life, which was about 23, 24 years, we became the largest dermatology company in the world. And mention some of your products, because they're huge. Sure. Uh, so we had a lot of medical dermatology products. We're the leading company treating acne and psoriasis and diseases like with, that. Which, which with products? Uh, products that probably wouldn't be widely known, but okay. Solidine, Theramycin Z, Ziana. Uh, over time, we became interested in aesthetic dermatology, and we developed Restylane, Dysport. Okay, uh, stop. Yeah. Do you understand Restylane, Dysport? They're huge. What's the market right now for Restylane and Dysport uh, annually? A billion. Easily, right? Yeah. And so you guys, did you develop those? Um, we did. We worked with partners, um, scientific partners, but yes, we developed and gained FDA approval for those products. Okay, so just so you know, Dysport is actually, was actually the first competitive product for Botox. Um, Botox came out on the market, and then Dysport was actually the first product to compete with Botox. It's a little bit different um, derivative of the botulism. Um, that's used in Botox, but you know some people claim it, it lasts a little bit longer and it's a little bit easier to use, correct? Some people believe that. Okay, and they're, then... They're both excellent products. And then Restylin is what people are using for fillers today. So as you age, if there are lines on your face that you want to have filled in, uh, Restylin is probably one of the most recognized products on the market. And between that, I would say together, they're probably each a billion dollar a year product. It's a very big market and we were lucky to, to kind of be part of developing it. We worked closely with a company called Allergan, which is the Botox maker. And I think our company and theirs really developed what's become a multi-billion dollar world market. So when I talked to you earlier, I said, what was your biggest challenge along the way? And I loved your response. Yeah, so I, I had that job from the founder to the exit. We were sold uh, some years ago to another New York Stock Exchange company. And the hardest thing for me, I guess, was reinvention. So there's a, a pretty big gap between someone who starts a company and gets it going and has the vision and someone who can actually run the company two decades later. And I was definitely not that guy at the beginning. I was a good founder. Um, I was very convincing about the prospects of the business. I think that I had the vision to help develop a business and hire incredibly talented people. But I wasn't the guy when I began to be able to run a business that was a you know multi-billion dollar business, highly mature, 
uh, with lots of employees and lots of structure and process. So I'd say that over the course of my 25 years there, I literally reinvented myself four or five times and became a different CEO, uh, sometimes leaving my personality behind. Um, I'm a pretty freewheeling, informal guy. Uh, I had to develop a lot of structure, a lot of personal discipline uh, in order to be able to succeed uh, as we went along. Um, probably there were places that I could have stepped out and given the, uh, given the job to someone that was uh, more suited and more talented for that role, but I decided instead to become that guy and that took a lot of, a lot of effort. So if, if, if one of my students watching is somebody that really has a burning desire to go into the cosmetic industry or pharmaceuticals, what kind of background would you suggest that they acquire now while they're in school or out of school that would really prepare them for that? I, I think the answer to the question is not so much different regardless of industry. I think if someone wants to have vision and lead a company, uh, there are a couple of very fundamental things. Uh, number one, try to be around smart people. Uh, and whether they are in the same field as you or not, just learning from them and seeing how they speak, how they respond to issues, how they analyze problems is pretty critical. I think, too, knowing how to write is, is really important. Um, Interesting. I, I see so many people uh, of, of many generations that literally cannot string five sentences together in a, in a correct form and, and a com communicative presenting way. So I think the ability to be able to communicate not just orally but verbally is critical. And in our technology intensive environment where it's easy to send a text or a quick email, the ability to write something thoughtful that's a little longer is really an absolutely necessary skill and can distinguish someone on their way up very easily. Because we don't just speak, we also write, people read things. So those are, those are critical skills. Obviously a broad scheme of knowledge is really important. Uh, I read about six or seven newspapers a day, uh, probably dozens of magazines a month, a lot of scientific journals. I try to get as much information as I can about anything so that no matter who I encounter, uh, I'm able to have a conversation with them about something, engage them at a level that's important to them, and hopefully draw them out uh, so that I can learn something from them. Uh, so when I think of mentorship as an example, uh, I never think of it as a one-way street. Uh, there have been a few people that I've made it a point to try to develop over the years because I saw their potential, but it turned out that they either surpassed me or were incredible in other areas, and I wound up learning as much from them as they could from me, but it started with having a common basis of communication. If someone's a sports fanatic, you've got to know what's going on in the sports world. If they're technology-driven, you've got to know what's current in technology. Maybe they like to watch movies or TV. So having that broad scheme of knowledge allows you to communicate with everyone, and everyone has something to offer. So I think having one's ears open is critical. I used to have a saying with my kids that you can't learn anything if your mouth is moving. So the ability to get someone else to talk and tell you about what's important to them, what skills they have, the way that they look at the world and problems, those are critical, critical insights. So you were in this business for 25 years? Yes. And then how did you sell the company? Well, I didn't necessarily want to sell the company. We were a publicly listed company on the New York Stock Exchange. We had a pretty significant market capitalization. We were worth a lot. And as a public company, you have a responsibility to listen to anyone that comes along that can help the shareholders to achieve more value. So a company came along and offered us a significant premium over where our stock was. They offered us more money than the rest of the world thought we were worth. And you have a fiduciary and, responsibility yeah, to listen to them. And right. if you don't take that deal, so I, I understand. So tell me what you're doing now. So uh, with many of my ex-colleagues at Medicis, with whom I'd worked for 15, 20 years, um, we started a new company that's kind of in the same business. So we sell um, non-prescription skincare products, but we sell them only in professional offices. So we sell principally to dermatologists and plastic surgeons, and these are products that are really designed to improve the quality and the texture of the skin. So we're dealing with wrinkles, with age spots, 
Uh, the things that really affect men and women commonly that are seeing a dermatologist or plastic surgeon. And why would you just sell it in their offices? Because today it's so easy to have things all over the internet and just do direct sales. It is, and that was a very difficult decision, but one that I think is born out of respect for plastic surgeons and dermatologists. They're taking the time to assess a patient, to recommend a product, to really instruct them on the best use of a product, and imagine how you'd feel if you'd gone through all that and then your patient walked out the door and just went online to Amazon or, or another reputable seller and just bought the product. It would have completely undermined all the time and effort that you put into it. So for us, it's a matter of respect and kind of holding the line and respecting professional boundaries and making sure that the products which we have that are potent, uh, they, they do things, hmm. uh, are really matched to the needs of a patient and not have patients just freelancing on the internet. Okay. So you've been at this current company for how long now? Um, it's we, We're just coming on our third and a half year of being in the market. And what are your uh, big goals for the company? Well, now? we've been the fastest growing company in this market for the last two years. Uh, we're certainly among the most successful already. And uh, as we began Medicis, our old company, we wanted to be the leading dermatology company in the United States. We have exactly the same aspiration for this company. We want to be the leading professional skincare company, and I think we're well on our way to that. Wow. All right. Now, I know, like me, philanthropy has been a really big part of your life. Can you talk a little bit about the, the, the organizations that are kind of near and dear to your heart? Sure. Um, I started an organization in 2012 called Max in Motion, and it's a, it's a foundation uh, that provides athletic scholarships to kids that are talented athletes but can't afford uh, to pay the training fees or the dues that are necessary for them to compete at a high level. Uh, we also have a, a function in this foundation that helps uh, kids with, uh, with handicaps, um, kids that uh, have some limitation physically um, that still want to compete, whether it's uh, power soccer or wheelchair basketball or wheelchair tennis. So we're very active in helping kids that are really committed aspirational athletes but either don't have the means financially or physically to compete um, without some assistance. That's awesome. I love that. Maybe there's a way we can get some of those kids to come to LEAP. If they're 15 to 25, we can help them with other stuff too. That well, would be fun. I'm sure they'd benefit from it. One of our goals at Max in Motion is not only to help kids to participate in sports because we see, we see the value of athletics as being so important, but to also introduce them to colleges, uh, to help them get recruited uh, by colleges to develop the right high school curriculum so that they'll be competitive. So it's not just about sports, it's That's about what, right. what sports yeah. does. That's right in our wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I, I, I like to teach at LEAP is copy genius. And one of my favorite podcasts always asks this question, so I'm going to copy genius and ask you, how much of your success do you think was pure luck versus hard work? Um, at least equal measure luck to hard work. I think that I work hard. I think that I've approached both people in my job with, uh, with respect and knowledge. Uh, but at the same time, I know that my start came from being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I've heard people say that you make your own luck and maybe there's truth to that. Uh, I think there's a certain amount of randomness in life and mm -hmm. things happen, sometimes good things, sometimes bad things. But when the good things happen, you have to be alert enough to take advantage of them. I think that's a very wise, wise, wise saying. One of the things that I tell kids at LEAP is number one, don't wait for opportunities in life, make opportunities. And number two, when you do get an opportunity, don't take it, master it. And you've done that. Well, we're trying every day, we learn more every day. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And um, that was amazing and interesting. And as one last takeaway, what would you say is probably the most important element in your success? It's a, it's a really hard question to answer because we've just decided that luck has as much to do with success as preparation or hard work. Um, I think being ready to accept an opportunity and believing that you can do it. Um, sometimes self-confidence is false and it's not justified objectively. But sometimes you just have to go for it and learn. And you know, there's that saying that you fake it until you make it. Uh, just understanding that if you work hard enough, you can learn to be what you want to be. Perfect. Jonas, thank you so much. Thanks. 
Dr. Bill, over and out.